I'm Todd Montgomery, and this is Unblocked by Design. So a little bit about me. I've been around uh, doing network protocols and networking for a very long time, uh, exceedingly long, uh, since the early 90s. Uh, most of my work uh, recently has been uh, involved in the trading community in exchanges and, and uh, bro brokerages, trading firms, things like that. So in finance. But uh, in general, I'm more of a high performance uh, type of uh, person. I, I tend to look at uh, systems that have to, because of their SLAs, be incredibly performant. Uh, but that's not all, uh, other things as well. So anyway, what we're going to talk about is uh, synchronous and asynchronous designs. Um, the idea of having sequential uh, operation and how that impacts things like uh, performance and things like that in some uh, hopefully have a few takeaways of things if you're looking to improve performance in this category, uh, things you can do. We'll talk about the illusion of sequentiality. All of our systems provide this illusion of the sequential nature of, uh, of how they work. Um, and I think it all boils down to exactly what do you do while waiting uh, and hopefully have some takeaways. So first, a little bit about wording here. Uh, when we talk about sequential or synchronous or blocking, we're talking about the idea that you do some operation, you cannot continue uh, to do things until uh, you, something has finished or things like that. And this is more exaggerated when you go across some sort of, a, I call it an asynchronous binary boundary. It could be a network, it could be sending things from one thread to another thread, or, uh, or a number of different things. Um, this a lot of these things make it more obvious as opposed to asynchronous or non-blocking types of uh, designs where you do something and then you go out to go off and do something else and then you come back and uh, can you know process the result or something or the the uh, response or something like that so with sync or synchronous you're looking at and I'll just use as an example throughout this because it's easy to talk about the idea of a request and a response. So you would send a request, there'd be some processing of it, and, and optionally you might have a response, even if it, the response is simply just to acknowledge that it has completed. So it doesn't always have to involve having a response, but there might be some blocking operation that happens until it is completed. So a normal function call is normally like this. Um, and if it's sequential operation, and there's not, th not really anything else to do at that time, that's perfectly fine. If there are other things that need to be done though, or it needs to be done on something else, then it's a lost opportunity. So ASIC is more about you know, the idea of initiating an operation, having some processing of it, and you're waiting then for a response. And this could be across you know, threads, uh, as I mentioned, cores, nodes, storage, all kinds of different things that where there is this opportunity to do things while you're waiting for the next step or that to complete or something like that. And so the idea of async is really, what is what do you do while waiting? Uh, it's a very big part of this. And just as an aside, when we talk about event-driven, we're talking about actually the idea of on the processing side, you would see a request come in. We'll denote that as on request. And on the requesting side, when a response comes in, you would have an on response or on complete or something like that, right? So we'll use those terms a couple times uh, throughout this. All of our systems provide this illusion of sequentiality, this program order of operation that we, re we really hang our ha hat on as, as developers. We look at this and we can simplify our lives by this illusion, but be prepared, it is an illusion. Um, and that's because a compiler can reorder, runtimes can reorder, CPUs can reorder. So everything is happening in parallel, not just concurrently, but in parallel. Uh, on all different parts of a system, operating systems, uh, and so, and as well as other things. It may not be the fastest way to, to just do step one, step two, step three. It may be faster to do steps one and two at the same time, or to do step uh, two before one because of other, other things that can be optimized. So, but by imposing order on that, we can make some assumptions about the state of things as we move along.
So ordering has to be imposed. And this is done by things in the CPU, such as the load store buffers, um, providing you with this ability to go ahead and store things to, to memory or to load them asynchronously. Our CPUs are all asynchronous. Um, storages are exactly the same way. Different levels of caching give us the ability for multiple things to be optimized along that path. OSs with virtual memory and caches do the same thing. Even our libraries do this with the ideas of promises and futures. Um, so the key is to wait. Uh, all of this provides us with the illusion that it's okay to wait. And it can be. But that can also have a price because uh, it is uh, the operating system can deschedule. Uh, when you're waiting for something and you're not doing other work, the operating system is going to take your time slice. It's also a lost opportunity to do work that is uh, not reliant on what you're waiting for. Um, and in some applications, it's perfectly fine. In others, it's not. And by having locks and signaling in that in that path, they do not come for free. They do impose some uh, constraints. So let's talk a little bit about that. Locks and signaling introduce serialization into uh, a speed up. So if you look at Omdahl's law, what it's really saying is uh, the amount of serialization that you have in your, uh, in your system is going to dictate how much speed up you get by throwing machines or processors at it. Uh, you, it, it. As you can tell from the graph, if you're not familiar with Omdahl's law, which I hope you would be, uh, but it does limit your scaling. Uh, and even just a simple thing such as 5% serialization within a process, and believe me, that's a small percent uh, compared to most systems, can reduce that scaling dramatically uh, so that you don't gain much as you keep throwing processors at it and scaling. But that's only part of the issue. Uh, it also introduces a coherence penalty. And if you want to see a coherence penalty in action, think of a meeting uh, where you have five people in it and how hard it is to to get everyone to sort of agree and understand each other and make sure that everyone knows uh, what is being talked about. Uh, this is coherence. It, it is a penalty that is attached uh, to, you know, the uh, getting every entity on the same page and understanding everything. When you add in a coherence penalty and do something like that, um, it turns out that Omdahl was an optimist, um, that it actually starts to decrease the speed up that you get because the coherence penalty starts to add up and add up and add up and add up. And so that becomes a dominant factor, in fact. Uh, so it's not simply that you have to reduce the amount of serialization, but you also have to realize that there, there's a coherence. Locks and signaling have a lot of coherence. And so this limits scaling. So one thing to realize is that by adding locks and, and having signaling, you are in effect limiting your scaling to some degree. But it goes even further than that. More threads, more contention, more coherence, less efficient operation. This isn't always the case, but it often is. But there is actually more to think about. And the reason why we're going through a lot of this, or I'm going through a lot of this, is to so that you have uh, some background in terms of thinking about this from a slightly different perspective. Um, I've had a lot of time to think about it, but I, and uh, as things, uh, systems that I've worked on, I've, I've sort of distilled down some things. So I always have to sort of set the stage by saying, you know, here's some of the things that limit, and here's how bad it is. But there are things we can do. So let's take a look here. So first, the synchronous kind of requests and responses. Let's say you have three different requests. You send one, you wait for the response, you send another, you send, and uh, you send a third, and you wait for the response. Um, that may be how your logic has to work. Um, but just re realize the throughput of how many requests you can do is limited by that round trip time. Not by the processing, it's limited by how fast you can actually send a request and get a response. And if you want to take a look at how our technology has grown, response time in systems does not get faster very quickly. In fact, we've very much stagnated on that response. You can take a look at clock speed, for example, with CPUs. But if you look at network bandwidth, storage capacity, memory capacity, and somewhat with CPU cores, although that hasn't grown as much, you know, as the accumulated improvements have grown over time, uh, they have grown more than improvements in response time, for example. So from a throughput perspective, 
we are limited. If you take a look at it from a networking perspective and look at it through throughput, just in trying to get data across, this stop and wait operation of sending a piece of data, waiting for a response, sending another piece of data, waiting for a response is limited by the round trip time. And you can definitely calculate it. You take the length of your data, you divide it by the round trip time, and that's it. That's as fast as you're going to go. Notice that you can only increase the data length or you can decrease the round trip time. That's it. You have nothing else to play with. But you'd rather kind of have something which was a little bit faster, right? You'd have, and, and this is a good example. A fire hydrant, let's ignore the pup for a minute, but the fire hydrant has a certain diameter. That has a relationship to how much water it can push out as opposed to a garden hose. Well, our networks are exactly the same thing. And it doesn't matter if it's network. It doesn't matter if it's uh, the bandwidth on a single chip between cores. All of them have the same thing, which is the bandwidth delay product. The bandwidth is how much you can put in it on a time. That's how big that pipe is. The delay is how long that pipe is. In other words, the time it takes to traverse. The bandwidth and delay product is the amount of bytes that can be in transit at one time. And notice, you know, you have a couple different things to play with here. To maximize that, you have to not only have a quick res uh, request, response, request, response, but you also have to have multiple pieces of data outstanding at a time. That in right there. So how big is it? Uh, in well, you know, the whole different conversation we could have, and there's some good stuff in there, but it's not what we're here to talk about today. Just realize that you want in to be more than just one. When it's one, you're waiting on you're you're waiting on round trips. So the key here is while something is, you know, processing or you're waiting is to do something. And that's one of the takeaways I want you to think of is there, it's a lost opportunity. What can you do while waiting and make that more efficient? And the short answer is while waiting, do other work. Um, having the ability to, to actually do other stuff is great. So the first thing is sending more requests, as we've saw. And so the, the, but the sequence here is how do you distinguish between the requests? Well, the relationship here is you have to correlate them, right? So you have to be able to basically identify each individual request and individual response. And that correlation, you know, gives rise to having things which are a little bit more uh, interesting, right? The ordering of them starts to become very relevant. Um, you need to figure out things like how to handle things that are not in order. So you can reorder them, uh, and you're just really looking at the relationship between a request and a response and matching them up. Uh, but and it can be reordered in any way you want, um, you know, to make things to make things simple. But it does provide an interesting question of what happens if you get something that you can't make sense of? Is it invalid? Do you drop it? Do you ignore it? Uh, in this case, you know, you get you you've sent request zero, and you got response for one. Um, you know, in this point, you're not sure exactly what the response for one is. Um, and so that's handling the unexpected. When you introduce async into a system where you're doing things and you're going off and doing other stuff, you have to figure out how to handle the unexpected, you know, because that's what actually makes a lot of things like network protocols, uh, how you handle them is very important. And so there's lots of things we can talk about here, but I want to just mention that errors are events. There's no real difference. A an event uh, it can be a success. It can also be an error. So you should think about errors and handling the expected as if they were events that just crop up in your system. Second thing to think about is uh, the unit of work. And when we think about this from uh, a normal threads perspective, we're just doing sequential you know, processing of data. We're doing work, and it's between the system calls that we do work. Uh, and if you take that same example I talked about, like a request uh, and in a response, if you think about it from, a res uh, from getting a request in, doing some work, and then sending a response, it's really the, time, the work done between system calls. System call to receive data, system call to send data. And the time between these system calls, right, that may have a high variance. Um, you know, on the server side, this isn't so... Uh, that complicated, but when you start to think about it from the other side, where it's, I do some work, I then wait, and then I get a response. Now it's highly varying in terms of the time between them, which may or may not be a concern, but it is something to realize. But when you turn it around and you say something like, uh, from an asynchronous perspective, the first thing you should think about is, okay, what is the work that I can do 
uh, between these. Now it's not simply just between system calls. And it's easier to think about this as a duty cycle. In other words, a single cycle of work. And that should be your first class concern. Uh, and I think the easiest way to think about this and, and it is to look at an example in pseudocode. So this is an async duty cycle. Uh, this looks like a lot of the duty cycles that I, I've written and I've seen written and helped write, which is you're basically sitting in a loop while you're running. I usually have some me mechanism to terminate it. Uh, but you usually poll inputs, and by polling, I don't. I definitely mean going to see if there's anything to anything to do, and if not, you simply return and go to the next step. You know, so you poll your if there's input, you check timeouts, you process pending actions, and the more complicated work is less in the polling of the inputs and handling them. It's more in the checking for timeouts, processing pending actions, those types of things. Those are more a little bit more complex. And then at the at, at the end, you might idle waiting for something to do, or you might just say, "Okay, I'm going to sleep for a, a millisecond," and then come right back. So you, you do have a little bit of, uh, of, of flexibility here uh, in terms of uh, idling, waiting for something to do. But the key here is you should always think about it as you can sh your units of work should always be making progress towards your goal. Once you break things down, which is where all the complexity comes into play, you start to realize that um, you know the the idea of making progress and thinking about things as steps, like you would normally do in just listing out logic, is kind of the same. But the difference here is that you have to think about it as more discrete as opposed to just being wrapped up. So to give an example of this, um, I've taken just a very simple example. You, let's say you're on a server and you get a request in, and the first step you need to do is to validate a user. You need, then you, if that's successful, you then process the request. If it's not successful, then you would send an error back. And then as once you're done, you send a response. And that response may be something as simple as, okay, I process your request. Um, but it could be that you generate a response. So if you turn that into sort of the asynchronous side, you can think about the, the request as being an event, like on request. Uh, the next thing you would do is you would request that validate. Now, I've made this deliberately a little bit more complicated. The validating of the user in a lot of sequ sequential logic is another blocking operation, and that's the actual operation we want to look at from an asynchronous perspective. So let's say that we have to request that validation externally. So you have to send it, send away for it to be validated and come back. And this might be from a secure enclave, or it could be from another library, or it could be uh, something else. Uh, or it could be some, from a totally separate system. But the key is that you have to wait at that point. So you go off and you process other things. Other requests that do not have this, uh, that don't, don't depend on this step, can be processed. Other pending actions. There could be additional input. For other requests, more requests, other on requests that come in. But at some point, you're going to get a response from that validation. It might be positive, it might be negative. Let's assume that it's positive here for a moment. So you would then process the request at that point. And that could spawn other stuff and send the response. But what I wanted to sort of point out here is that's the lost opportunity. If you simply just did get a request, validate user, and then you just go to sleep, that, that's less efficient, right? It's lost opportunity. So you want to see how you would break it down. So that's where you would, that's where having a duty cycle comes into play. That's where that duty cycle helps you to basically look at this and to do other stuff. And so breaking it down into states and steps. So the at the first time, you actually had a implicit set in the sequential version on the left of states that something went through, like Request received, request being validated, request validated okay, processing requests, sending response. Those, those states are now explicit in a lot of cases on the right. So think about it from that perspective. You've got those states, it's just how you've managed it. And one of the more complicated things to handle here is the idea of, okay, that didn't work and I have to try it again. So you know, retrying logic is one of the things that makes some of these asynchronous uh, duty cycles much more complicated. So things like transient errors, back pressure, and load are just uh, some of the things that you might look at as transient error, uh, transient conditions that you then can try again. Uh, so if we 
look at that now from a little bit different perspective. Uh, we take sort of and expand this a little bit. So on a request, request to validate, you wait, it's okay, and you process a request, send a response. That's the happy path, right? The not so happy path is when you, uh, it's not the case where you get an error on the validate and you say, no, can't do that. It's where you get a error that basically says, okay, retry. And th this does not add that much compl complexity if you're tracking it as a set of state changes. Because you would get the request, and if we look at this, we'll see this on the right there. You would request the validate, you wait, it's the same as before. On validate, if the invalidate, if the onvalidate error indicates that you, it's not a permanent error, like somebody put in bad credentials, let's say that it was, you know, the system for validation was overloaded, please wait and retry. You would wait some period of time. That is not any more complex than waiting for that response, right? You're simply just waiting for a timeout. But the key here is that you would then request validate again. And you can add things like a number of retries and things like that, but it doesn't really make things more complicated. It, it, something may hide this underneath of you for the sequential case, but it's just lost opportunity. So this is about what I mean by making progress. This is making progress at some form every step of the way. But again, one size is not fit all. This talk is short. Uh, you know, there's lots of things to take away here. And, uh, you know, I don't, it would be great if we had more time, but unfortunately we don't. Definitely in the Q&A here, I'm sure there's going to be questions, there's going to be comments. Please, uh, you know, more than happy to talk about them. But, and I don't, I don't want to get you to think that one size fits all here. It does not. Um, takeaways here are the opportunity when you're waiting uh, for something external to happen or things like that. If you think about it from an asynchronous perspective, we may think that a lot of times it's complicated, but it's not. It's what do you do when waiting? Sometimes it's easy a question to answer or and leads us down interesting paths. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and not all systems need to be async, uh, but there's a lot of systems that could really benefit from being asynchronous and thinking about it that way. So thank you, uh, and we'll take some questions now. Thank you for a great presentation. I always enjoy your presentations. Also, thank you to all of you for joining the session today. Um, we had a couple of interesting questions on the on the chat. Uh, also, I encourage everybody to uh, share questions on the chats uh, so uh, we can answer them. Um, I had. I'm going to start with a question from me, if that's okay. Sure. Um, um, so, so you did talk about the, you know, the the duty cycle and how you would write it. So, in reality, how much a developer actually write that and just you instead, but instead use a framework that will do most of the work for them? Oh, uh, I think most of the time, um, developers using use frameworks and patterns that are already in existence. They don't do the duty cycle, um, and right. I and I think that's perfectly fine. But I think that also makes it so that it's easy to miss the idea of what a unit of work is. So, and to sort of tie that to one of the qu questions that was asked about, you know, actor model, reactive programming, patterns and anti-patterns. Um, what I've seen repeatedly is um, when e using any of those, the idea of a unit of, unit of work is sort of lost. Um, and yep. what creeps in is the fact that in that unit of work, now you have additional, you know, basically blocking operations. Um, validation is one that I used here because I've seen multiple times where the idea of, okay, I got a piece of work in. The first thing I'm going to do is go and block waiting for a validation externally. Uh, and, but I'm using an, an, you know, I'm using the actor model uh, in, our, in a, this framework. And so it's, it's efficient, but I can't figure out why it's slow. Right. And so that, so I think, I think the frameworks do a really good job of providing a good model, but you still have to have that concern about um, what is the unit of work? Does that unit of work have additional steps that are, can be broken down, um, you know, in that, in that framework? And so I, I think that, um, that, that there's nothing wrong with using those frameworks, but to get the most out of them, you still have to come back to the idea of what is this unit of work and is it, can I break it down further? Um, and that that's something I've, uh, and, and it's hard. None of this is easy. 
you know, I just want to get that across. I'm not trying to wave my hands and say this all is, is easy or we should look at it, you know, more, be more diligent or rigorous. It's difficult. Um, you know, programming is difficult in general. This just makes it a little bit harder. Yeah, yeah I agree. I mean, at, uh, at Twitter, we use Finego, which is uh, a synchronous mm -hmm. RPC that most of our services use to communicate. And sometimes the Finego team have to go and um, very careful to tell other developers, you should not really do blocking calls inside the critical parts of, of Finego. <laughs> that, that's not the, the point. You know, you, you schedule them using Finego. You don't block you know, because you know you block all the yep. finagle threads, and that's that's not a good idea. So, but we haven't eliminated most of those. So, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I agree that none none of this none of this stuff is easy. Um, uh, we can take. Um, uh, do you want to elaborate on a couple of uh, questions that we had uh, on the chat? So, uh, the first one from Sebastian was like, any recommendations out of this uh, actor model reactive program patterns and patterns? Would you like to elaborate more a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I. One, I am a fan of the actor model. Um, I like the, I, again, if you look at me, the systems that I, I have out in open source and have worked on, um, using cues a lot, using the idea of um, communication and then, you know, sort of having processing that is done. It, it, it's, it's not, I don't want to say it's, it's the actor model, but I think that model is easier, at least for me to think about. And that might be because of my background with protocols and packets on the wire and units of work are kind of baked into that a lot. So I have a very much an affinity for things that make the concept of a unit of work um, already to be something that is very front and center. And the actor model does that. But having said that, things like the, you know, reactive programming, um, especially with the RX style, um, you know, I think have a lot of benefit from the composition side. So I, always encourage people to look at that, uh, you know, whether it makes sense to them or not is sort of, you know, you have to look at various things and see what, you know, what works for you. Uh, but I think reactive programming has uh, a lot. And that's why I was involved in things like R socket, reactive socket and stuff like that. Um, I think that those have a lot of very good things in them. Uh, beyond that, I mean, patterns and anti-patterns, I think learning queuing theory, which uh, it, it may sound intimidating, but it's not. Um, most of it is, uh, you know, fairly easy to sort of absorb at the high enough level that you can see far enough to help systems is one of those things that I think uh, pays for itself. Um, just like learning basic data structures, um, we should teach a little bit more about queuing theory and things behind it, because that's where, you know, uh, getting an intuition for how queues work and sort of yeah. the, some of the theory behind them goes a huge way. Uh, when looking at systems, real live systems, um, you know, at least, at least it has for me, um, you know, but uh, I, 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 I do encourage people to look at that, you know, beyond that uh, technologies, frameworks. Um, I, I think you, 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 by spending your time more looking at what is behind a framework, in other words, the concepts, you do much better than just looking at how to, you know, use a framework that may be front and center because that's what you want to do, but go deeper, go deeper into what is it built on? Why does it work this way? Why doesn't it work this other way? Uh, you know, asking those questions, I think you'll learn a lot, you know, a tremendous amount. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great point. Um, uh, uh, Sebastian, I hope uh, to answer your question. Feel free to follow up with uh, more if you want on the chat. And again, I would encourage everybody to, to share some more questions on the chat. Um, the other one from David, uh, the networking part of the, of the industry has solved this with TCP, UDP, UT, HTTP3. What has prevented us from solving this in an industry-wide manner at an application level? <laughs> how, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that one, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, I guess the, the way that I think of it, because I'm coming from that. Uh, I spent so much time, you know, early on in my career learning protocols and learning how protocols were designed and, and designing protocols. And so from my perspective, um, it is a lesson I learned early. It had a big influence on me. So when I look back and why hasn't, you know, why haven't we applied a lot of that to applications? It's because um, just like our, as CPUs provide you with program order and compilers reorder, but with the idea that none of your critical path that you look through and your program and your mind is still gonna function step one, step two, step three. 
by giving this illusion of sequentiality that we can b base our mental models on, it's given us the idea that it's okay to just, you know, not be concerned about it. Whereas at the networking level, you don't have any, any way to not be concerned about it, uh, especially if you want to make it, you know, efficient. And so I think as um, things like performance become a little bit more important because of, you know, in effect, climate change, you know, and I, and and we're starting to see that performance is something that people take into consideration for other reasons than just you know the trading community, for example. Um, we'll, we'll start to see some of this revisited because there's good lessons that we need. They just need to be brought into like more of the application space. At least that's my thought. Yeah. Um, quick follow up from Sebastian. Any preference for an actor model framework? Erland, Elixir, Aka, something else? <laughs> um, personally, uh, you know, I actually like Erlang and Elixir from um, the standpoint of the mental model. Um, and some of that has to do with the fact that as I was kind of learning Erlang, uh, you know, uh, and I got to talk to Joe Armstrong um, and got to really kind of sit down and have some good conversations with him. And I, I it, it was not surprising to me. And after reading his dissertation and every, and a lot of the other work, uh, it, it, it was something that was clearly so close to where I came from, you know, from the networking perspective and everything else, but there was so much good that was there that I, you know, I, I, I find when I get to use some Erlang, um, I haven't actually used Elixir, uh, you know, any more than just playing around with it, but Erlang, I've written a few things in, uh, and especially recently, and I really do like kind of the idioms of Erlang. So from a, from a, you know, aesthetic perspective, I, I, I do kind of, and I know it's odd, I kind of do prefer that. Akka is something I'm also familiar with, um, but I haven't used it in any bigger system. Um, I've used Go and, or, and Rust and a few others that have pieces of the same things. And I, I think, it, it, it is really nice to see those, but I, it, it's very much more of a personal choice. The Erlang or Elixir thing is simply just something that I've had the opportunity to use heavily, uh, you know, off and on uh, last several years and really do like, uh, but it does, it's not for everyone. Um, and so I think it, you know, that's just a personal preference, but I, I think looking at, the keeping an open mind, trying things out on your own, I think is very valuable. So if possible, I suggest, you know, looking at what, you know, kind of speaks to you, um, you know, using, so whenever you use a framework or a language, there's always that, you know, thing of, well, this works, but it's a little clunky and then this isn't great. So everything is pretty much bad all over, right? It doesn't matter. It's just personally, you find, as you use something, it, I find if you like something, you haven't probably used it enough, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I do encourage people to take a look at Erlang, uh, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you should do that and avoid other stuff. You should try everything out and see what speaks to you. Yeah, I've, I've always been fascinated by Erlang, and I don't want, don't want to spend more time on this, but um, I've always been fascinated because I'm a garbage collection person, and it has a very interesting like memory <laughs> management model. And the fact that like your know, thread local GC in the language, basically, the language kind of assures it uh, the, the yep. way it structures the, uh, you know, the object. So yeah, that, you know, that's been fascinating for me. Um, so talking of different technologies, are, are you familiar with Project Loom? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, um, it's just for a little bit of intro introduction. Project Loom basically is supposed to introduce fibers in Java, which are very, very lightweight threads. So the idea is that, um, you know, you can run thousands of them and they're not going to fill up, you know, your memory because no, we're going to have a full stack and no, we're going to have a full, um, uh, oh, any thoughts on Java fibers? Yeah, you're reading <laughs> my mind, uh, Rajiv. Um, uh, yeah, and the idea is that are very lightweight and then you can run thousands of them and then you get the best parallels, but if one of them, you know, starts doing some um, synchronous I/O, another one will be scheduled then very, very quickly. So I just needed to kind of give a little bit of introduction. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm hopeful, but uh, I'm also of the mind that I've been down this road a couple times where um, you know the idea of you know sort of let's just have lighter weight threads um, has come up a few times and. Um, 
and what what tends to happen is we don't still we we think well this is hidden from me and so I won't take care of it or I won't think about it until you know it becomes an issue um and so I'm hopeful but I don't think that's really where the you know the where we should spend some of that time. I don't see it as a panacea and all, all of a sudden the coherence penalty and the serialization will go away, yeah. which are in, inherent in a lot of those designs. So I, it would be, uh, it would be very interesting to see how, you know, this gets applied to some systems that I've seen. Uh, you know, I've seen some systems with 600 threads running on, you know, two cores and they're just painful. And it's not because yeah. of the application design except for the fact that it, they're just interfering with one another and lightweight threads don't help that they can make it worse. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see how things go. I'm very, I'm hopeful, but I'm not, you know, uh, I, it, I, I'm holding my breath in essence to see how that kind of stuff comes out. Some of the things that have come out of project loom that have impacted the JVM are great though, because there's certain things that, you know, I and others have looked at for many years and thought, well, this should just be better because this is clearly just bad, uh, uh, you know, looking at them. And they have improved a number of those things. And I think that's great. That's awesome. Um, you know, but uh, I, I'm not exactly sold on the direction, but I'm hopeful. OK, yeah, I'm, I'm also kind of fascinated to see how, you know, where it's going to find usage and where it's going to improve things. So mm -hmm. um, we'll see. Um, we have a couple more uh, minutes, I think. So um, I'll, I'll ask one final question. So one of the most challenging aspects of doing something like an asynchronous design where, you know, you send requests and then you kind of get them later is actually um, error reporting and error tracking. So if you have a linear piece of code, you know, like, okay, it failed here, so I know what's going on. If you have an exception in the middle of one of these requests, it's, sometimes it's challenging to kind of associate it with what was going on, if, if, yeah. if that makes sense. Any, any thoughts on that? Um, well, a lot of code that I've seen that has a big block and a try and a catch, and then it has like IO exception, and there's like a whole bunch of IO that happen. Yeah. It, you know, some of the sequential logic has the same problem. It's when did it so i think in my mind it's context um so yeah, yeah. you know it, it it it's really what what was the operation if it's an event that comes in you can handle it just like an event you know so you might think about state change and i think that is an easier way to deal with some exceptions in, in big blocks as well yeah, is to yeah. think about it break it down and to, and to and to look at it in a different way so i you know my mind um I think that it makes sense to think of them as events, which is something I've harped on for a number of years uh, now. When you look at these, uh, when you look at systems, you should think of them as errors should be higher level and, and handled a little bit, you know, better in context. Doesn't mean you handle them locally. It means you handle them with yeah, the context yeah. that they should right, have. Right, right, um, right. You know, so that, that to me, it, but, but it is hard. And one of the things that does make them a little bit easier in my mind are things like RX and other patterns that, you know, an error pro happens as an event, um, you know, that yeah, you can yeah. deal with slightly separately, which forces you to have a little bit more context for, for them. Right, right. Um, okay, uh, thanks again. Um, uh, thanks to all the attendees. And then we're going to drop off and then join the Zoom Hangout. So um, anybody who's interested, join us, and then we can have a conversation there. Yeah, thank you, Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.